if you applaud at the beginning, then I have reduced incentives to do well. So <laughs> you should wait until. Uh, okay, so this is uh, Chicago's best ideas. The idea of these was to highlight Chicago's best ideas. When the first one started, professors got up and talked about the ideas of our predecessors, people like Ronald Coase and uh, Richard Posner and Richard Epstein. Well, I'm not any of these people. Uh, and this is probably not one of Chicago's best ideas. <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, a quote from one of my favorite movies, Caddyshack. Judge Schmales tells Danny Noonan the world needs ditch diggers too. In the realm of uh, Coase and Posner and Epstein, I'm a relative ditch digger. So we'll just say this is a Chicago idea and a new one. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see if it's interesting to you. Um, this is an example of uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration. What happens when you get a securities law professor in the room with someone who likes civil procedure, the former being me, the latter being William Hubbard, uh, what they can come up with. And the inspiration for this project was a congressional statute, we'll look at in a second, that tries to tell federal judges what to do. I think uh, before I came to law school, I had a kind of naive view about judging. And that naive view about judging was something like, uh, Congress writes the laws, and there is something that is law. It is, uh, as my Arabic grandfather would say, uh, written, and that it is sacred, and there is content to it, independent of the views that the judges bring themselves. Well, that view was qu quickly uh, disabused by the legal realist school, who viewed law as something more akin to a politics. Several years ago, uh, my colleague Tom Miles and my former colleague Cass Sunstein wrote a paper called The New Legal Realism, in which they tried to uh, talk uh, more about the uh, judicial behavior in a kind of an empirical setting. So they looked at the influence that politics had on judging. For instance, uh, a panel of three judges on the Court of Appeals might reach different outcomes depending on the politics of the panelists. A panel composed of three Democrats versus three Republicans. Or two Democrats and one Republican versus two Republicans and one Democrat. And what they found, interestingly, in some areas of law, not all, <coughs> but in some areas that are maybe more political, like uh, employment discrimination cases, for instance, where we think Republicans are going to be more skeptical of employment discrimination claims and Democrats will be more favorably inclined to fighting them. What they found is, for sure, three Republicans were more likely to vote in favor of the employer. Not surprising. What is interesting is when you add a Democrat to the panel. So now it's two Republicans who can outvote the Democrat. Let's assume that they just vote uh, as their politics suggests, what they found is those two Republicans are more moderate in the presence of a Democrat, even though they have the votes to win. And the same is true when you add a Republican to a Democrat panel. They moderate the decision. So they find these kind of panel effects uh, in judging. Since that time, there's been a huge literature, growing, growing literature on judicial behavior. We hosted a conference this year on the subject uh, of which this paper was a part. Uh, Judge Posner and uh, my colleague William Landis have written a book on the subject along with uh, Lee Epstein who uh, is now at University of Washington St. Louis uh, on the determinants of judicial behavior. And so that's what this uh, paper is about in the securities law uh, context. Uh, the research question here uh, for the paper <laughs> is uh, do judges do what Congress tells them to do? Uh, again, my naive view of judging would be if Congress tells you this is the law, that judges would follow the law. I think all of us here, and there are some future judges out there among us, believe there is something important about following congressional commands. If we didn't think that, I think we would 
uh, uh, imagine the world as being quite lawless. If judges could do whatever they wanted, they're largely unaccountable, and if they're not doing what Congress says, if they're not following statutory commands, I think we would think that was something like uh, legal anarchy. Not cats and dogs living together, but, uh, but closer to mass hysteria than where we are uh, today. My uh, uh, impression before I started this project, though, was that uh, judges would not always do what Congress wanted them to do. If it was the case that Congress commanded do X and there was perfect compliance, then an empirical study looking at what drove judicial behavior wouldn't be that interesting because judges would just do what Congress said. On the other hand, if judges never did what Congress suggested, again, it wouldn't be very interesting because we would look at all the de potential determinants of, of uh, judicial behavior and we would find none of it mattered because they never did what Congress said. So assuming there is some compliance with law, but not perfect compliance, we can use empirical methods to see if we can drill down and determine what drives judicial compliance. If they comply in 50% of the cases, and not 50% of the, and not, and the other 50 they don't comply, what's different about the 50% of the cases where they comply? Okay, the punchline, uh, the, the, uh, the end result of our empirical analysis is that Congress, uh, a congressional command to federal district court judges to do X in this particular context, and I'll tell you what that is in a second, judges apply, uh, comply with that 14% of the time. Staggeringly low, uh, we'll see why in a second. The stakes are pretty low uh, for, these, uh, for this determination, but, but that's uh, getting a little bit ahead of myself. Another point, uh, and this will become a little bit more clear in a second, judges follow the law, the congressional command, where it's least important. Again, this is kind of surprising. We would think judges would do uh, X when X really mattered. Uh, and as in this context, they do it where it matters uh, the least. As it turns out, what actually drives uh, judicial compliance is not what the law is, but rather what the lawyers require them to do. That is, the punchline of the paper fundamentally is Judges do not have an inherent, noble, idealistic desire to follow the law. They merely do follow the law. They merely do what they're told when the lawyers hold them to heel. When they, lawyers make judges do something, they will do it. If judges, lawyers don't make them do it, judges will not do it, even though it is, uh, quote unquote, uh, the law. As I go through this, uh, discussion, uh, keep in mind some potential theories for why judges would not follow a congressional command. I've listed a couple of here. Uh, the first is flouting. I know what it is and I won't do it. Uh, one of the myth busters has a line for this that I like. He says, I reject your reality and I substitute my own. Uh, and that's the kind of flouting idea, right? The imagine, uh, and it is true in this case, that the congressional statute at issue here was a highly political statute passed by right-wing conservative nut jobs. And you are a Ninth Circuit judge, right? <laughs> you uh, live in San Francisco. Uh, you eat only non-GMO organic foods. You wear all hemp clothing. You only listen to NPR. You might just say, Newt Gingrich can write whatever he wants in the uh, CFR. I'm not going to do it. I've taken an oath to uphold the Constitution. I, don't, I think this is outside of it. I'm not going to do it. That, that's the kind of flouting idea. Uh, negligence is another uh, possible theory. Uh, judges don't take the care level that they should in understanding what the law is or applying the law, and so they're just sort of negligent in their application of the law. Uh, a related point is uh, a lack of incentives. They, uh, it's not that they uh, are negligent necessarily, but they just have no reason 
to, to learn what the law is or no reason to apply it in a particular case. Uh, again, a related concept is uh, perhaps that judges are just inherently lazy. That is, they need large amounts of incentives to motivate them to action. So these are not, uh, this is not a mutually exclusive list, but maybe some just different uh, uh, categories of uh, potential theories. Congress wants judges to do something. How can they get them to do it? Well, uh, unfortunately, one of the best ways to get uh, judges to comply is foreclosed by the Constitution. We could say to judges, um, hurry up and be faster deciding cases. And if you don't hurry up uh, and address the backlog, we are going to pay you less. We are going to dock your pay. Or uh, we're going to uh, incentivize you. The faster you do your trials, the faster you clear the docket, we have a nice little bonus payment at the end of the year for judges who are particularly good. I bet if we polled federal judges and we asked them who the competent judges are, who the ones that take their job seriously are, we would get a pretty clear consensus about who good judges are and bad, again, putting aside ideology. Why wouldn't we pay those judges more? Why wouldn't we reward them with something? None of them are going to make it to the Court of Appeals in expectation. None of those guys are going to get promoted to the Supreme Court. So you have the ultimate, uh, you know, I, I, should, I could sympathize as someone with tenure, you have the ultimate <laughs> invitation to laziness. Another uh, possibility is uh, reputational sanctions. Uh, this can work in uh, the context of someone with tenure. I can not be invited to conference. Eric Posner can not sit with me at lunch. <laughs> People can talk behind my back. All sorts of potential shaming. This is a lot harder for federal district court judges. Um, there is an example of this. The so-called Biden reports are uh, congressionally published uh, statistical tables about how quickly district courts move through their dockets. Uh, and that's an attempt by Congress to shame judges into doing better. I'm not sure it works so well, but it's a possibility. Congress could bring the judges or uh, bring a judge to uh, Washington and, and reprimand them for only complying 14% of the time, but uh, that's obviously uh, something that we're not uh, very familiar with. Another way to control judges is to uh, mandate that they do something. Uh, this is playing on judges, uh, what I would imagine is their kind of inherent desire to do what the law says. And I would have thought, uh, again, naively before doing this study, this would have been very powerful. That if you say to a district court judge, this is the statute, it is absolutely clear, it admits no, uh, no possibility of interpretation. There is no ambiguity that judges would follow that. And that's uh, what we're testing here. Here's an example of, a, a man, of such a mandate. This is in the uh, Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. That's PSLRA, Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Uh, and it added Section 21D to the uh, 1934 Securities Act, and it requires, in any private action arising under this title, the court shall include in the record specific findings regarding compliance by each party and each attorney representing any party with each requirement of Rule 11B of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure as to any complaint, responsive pleading, or dispositive motion. So, in any securities class action lawsuit, brought under the 1934 Act, at the end, in any final adjudication, and that includes dismissals of the case, voluntary dismissals of the case, that includes uh, a motion to dismiss that is granted with prejudice, that includes the settlement of the case, that includes a summary judgment motion that is dispositive, or uh, a trial resulting in a uh, outcome. In any of those cases, the court shall include specific findings about compliance with Rule 11. We have all know what Rule 11 is. Have the parties uh, 
entered into the litigation or conducted the litigation in a way that is designed to harass, uh, delay, et cetera. The gist being, was this suit designed to get to the truth? Was it about the pursuit of justice? Or was this about harassing the other side? Were you trying to create a nuisance, the suit is a nuisance, and the defendant is happy to pay you to make that nuisance go away, to abate that nuisance? That's the judicial uh, inquiry that is required. Let me give you a little bit of a back uh, story about um, uh, securities litigation and Rule 11 in securities litigation. Prior to the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, uh, the widespread but not universally shared view was that security class actions were an abysmal failure. The reason was that uh, an individual who owned just one share could hire a lawyer that lawyer could bring a, uh, a fraud suit representing the class of all shareholders holding those shares, seeking to uh, require current shareholders to pay for losses for former shareholders. So imagine the following. Uh, the federal government requires, for those of you who had securities litigation, requires voluminous disclosures. A IPO, an initial public offering of stock, has a disclosure that is several hundred pages long. And issuers of stock under these disclosure documents are subject to strict liability for any misstatement or omission in this three or four hundred page document. So the company uh, makes this disclosure, which is required by law. They sell some stock. And it turns out that the stock price uh, falls. Let's say the market conditions change and the stock price uh, when they sold it was $10, the stock market uh, is uh, uh, suffering a decline, uh, market conditions change, now the stock is worth $5. Nothing about the disclosures was particularly related to the drop in the stock price, it was just market conditions change. And now the stock's worth half of what it was. A lawyer can sue on behalf of someone who owns one share and has suffered a $5 loss. In, if they can find a misstatement or omission in that document, they bring a class action on behalf of all shareholders, and everyone would be entitled to $5. This could run into the many hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. So, as the stock price drops, lawyers will rush to the courthouse. They had complaints that were uh, cookie cutter complaints basically forms that they would add in the names of the companies and run to the courthouse with no factual allegations at all other than there was a misstatement in the disclosure documents. They would file the securities class action and if the case got past the motion to dismiss, the cost of defending the case would run into the millions of dollars and those plaintiff's lawyers would happily go away and settle the case for a few million dollars to save the company, uh, let's say, $10 million of expected litigation costs. Now, this is not to say there was no securities fraud prior to 1995, but just that this process, which enabled lawyers to immediately upon a stock drop, file a pro forma complaint, and then be able to extract a, pay, a nuisance payment from uh, companies generated litigation mills, that every stock price drop generated a lawsuit. And many plaintiff's lawyers got fabulously rich. As a footnote, Many of those plaintiff's lawyers are currently in jail because they were paying uh, uh, shareholders uh, kind of a bounty for bringing them the business. Okay, whether this made uh, firms better off or not was the subject of intense scholarly debate leading up to 1995 and the consensus was it didn't uh, because uh, basically one group of shareholders was paying another and this process was very uh, broken. Part of the Republican contract for America was the passage of the PSLRA. It passed over President Clinton's veto in 1995. And it made many cha changes to this process. It made pleading more, uh, the uh, pleading had to be more particular, the fraud uh, claims. The process for choosing lead plaintiffs was changed so that the biggest person who owned the, the largest number of shares was presumptively the lead plaintiff. It stayed discovery until the court had a chance to rule on the motion to dismiss. Uh, and it included this provision uh, that we just talked about, 
the uh, mandatory filings of Rule 11. Congress was saying, we observe plaintiff's lawyers abusing the system. These suits are about harassment and delay and nuisance. We want courts to use Rule 11 more. And the way we're going to make them do that is by telling them they must make the findings. I should note, for those of you who have studied Rule 11, this was kind of an odd choice. In 1983, the Congress, as part of the Reagan Revolution, tried to reinvigorate Rule 11 generally in all cases by making it much less discretionary on the part of judges. From the period from 1983 to 1993, we had a regime of much more aggressive Rule 11 uh, jurisprudence under the statute. And it was viewed by everyone as a complete failure. For instance, uh, every motion was subject to Rule 11 findings by courts. So when one side would make Rule 11, finding, uh, Rule 11 allegation against the other side, the other side, who was alleged to have been violating Rule 11, would make a Rule 11 motion against that side, saying their Rule 11 motion was in violation of Rule 11. <laughs> this kind of collateral litigation just completely subsumed the federal judiciary. The number of Rule 11 uh, cases ballooned, and no one thought litigation was any purer uh, during this period. So the Congress in 1993 and the Supreme Court who writes the Rules of Civil Procedure went back to the old version. The Republican move to reinvigorate Rule 11 just in securities class actions happens just as we realized Rule 11 is basically a failure. Okay, uh, this is a nice uh, way of uh, a mandate. Uh, 78U, which adds Section 21, uh, uh, C here to the Securities Act is a nice way of testing judicial behavior because it is something that ignores potential selection effects. In other words, what really, when we see a judge is not complying, what we're really seeing is uh, them not complying. It isn't that the rule affects the judicial behavior uh, I mean, the litigant behavior about what the kind of cases that are brought, it's really about, uh, uh, it reduces these kinds of selection effects. But at the outset, these kinds of mandates are extremely uh, rare, which suggests they may not be very uh, effective. Okay, the motivation here was uh, some securities uh, uh, academics who, and some practitioners who said anecdotally, boy, there is this requirement, but it doesn't seem like anybody takes it very seriously. And then some uh, Second Circuit and Fourth Circuit cases which uh, chastised district courts for not making the rulings. They said, hey, district court, you're required to make these findings and you didn't, I'm remanding to you to uh, make the findings. So for someone who is, um, empirically minded, you see a kind of anecdotal conventional wisdom plus some appeals court cases and you say, hey, is this anecdotal evidence consistent with, uh, with uh, the larger uh, evidence? So that's uh, the motivation behind the, uh, behind the uh, study. Okay, so uh, what determines whether or not judges comply? Well, there's a couple of possibilities. The first is that um, Judges and lawyers have to know about the mandate. Obviously, if no one knows about it, no one will comply. And then another factor is whether or not the parties have incentives and the judges have incentives to raise uh, the issue. So uh, think about this. Imagine that uh, Congress changes the law and says that fraud has to be pled uh, with particularity. Or that misrepresentations, as I have here on the slides, have to be deliberate. There is a, uh, a very high scienter requirement. That's the law. That's what Congress requires. And district courts just completely flout it, or they're lazy, or they're negligent about the rule. What do we expect to happen? What we'd expect to happen is the side who is disadvantaged by the non-compliance to raise that issue with the district court, with the Court of Appeals, or with the Supreme Court. So. If the district court doesn't comply with the law and says, ah, misrepresentations don't have to be deliberate, the side who is uh, the defense in that case will 
raise their hands and say, no, 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 no. They have to prove that it's deliberate and they haven't met that burden. Now consider another aversion, which is trials can only last five days. A procedural requirement. Congress says no federal trial shall last more than five days. Is this likely to be followed in the same way that the you must uh, plead that misrepresentations are deliberate? Well, it's very unlikely because let's imagine that the courts, the litigants, and everybody involved in the process thinks that this trial should last 10 days. It's in the interest of justice that this trial lasts 10 days. Well, if the judge lasts, lets the trial last for 10 days, there will be nobody to complain. The parties will have agreed and acquiesced to this, and no one will raise this issue on appeal. And if no one will raise the issue on appeal, nothing can uh, really uh, come of the uh, requirement. OK, so that's our kind of setup for what the incentives are. In terms of our accounts of judicial behavior, there are uh, several possibilities we can test with the data. Uh, one that we can reject right out of hand pretty straightforwardly is the perfect agent account. That is, judges do whatever Congress says they should do. But there's some other things we could test. Do judges learn over time uh, what the statute is and therefore compliance should be increasing in time? Is judicial inertia a serious factor? That is, judges who have been on the bench for a long time, are they more or less likely to comply than new judges? This is, we could call this uh, the old dog's new tricks problem, right? I've been a judge for 30 years. Congress passes some stupid statute. Oh, I don't have time to worry about that. I'll just keep doing it the way I've been doing it. What about judicial ideology? This was a very politically, uh, uh, overtly political bill, the PSLRA. The uh, trial lawyers who uh, support uh, uh, democratic politicians were very opposed to this. Businesses who generally uh, support uh, Republicans were more in favor. So might judicial, judicial ideology matter? Democrat, uh, uh, judges appointed by Democrats, maybe more or less likely to um, uh, uh, comply. How about uh, appeals courts? What effect do appeals courts have on district court behavior? A th one theory of uh, appellate courts is that they are a kind of error correcting mechanism. District courts will make errors, maybe out of negligence, maybe out of laziness, maybe out of ideology, and appellate courts can correct that. Uh, and then finally, the litigant behavior uh, uh, count that I mentioned. Okay. Uh, we, we collected at great pain a data set of all securities cases during a 14 year period. There were 21,000 uh, docket sheets with uh, over 800,000 docket entries. And we looked in these for. Uh, evidence of uh, the language about Rule 11. We looked for the statute in its various forms, Rule 11, sanctions, and so forth in these docket sheets. And we came out with uh, a thousand cases that we could use as a good test from 78 district courts uh, and 454 uh, different uh, judges. So we have 1,039 cases. And in these, only 140 had the required uh, sanction determination. Amazingly, 125 of these were boilerplate, where the, all the court did was kind of cut and paste the following. I can't believe you're making me do this. The court finds that the lawyers complied with Rule 11. OK. Not what Congress had in mind. Right? I don't think anybody thinks the, uh, the young whippersnapper Republican congressman who took control in 1994 and were thinking, how could we rein in these evil trial lawyers, thought that by mandating district court judges to do this, that they'd only comply 14% of the time, and that when they did, they would basically be just be you know, whipping their finger uh, at the uh, Congress uh, from 20 years ago saying, oh, okay, 
here you go, here's your compliance, right? Okay. Is there judicial learning? Uh, I don't know if this is at all uh, legible, uh, but uh, there is a little bit. This is a regression table. Uh, we run a regression, we've got uh, various factors that might drive compliance, and we put those on the right-hand side of the equation. The left-hand side is, did the court comply or not? And on the other side, we put a variety of, uh, of, of uh, data. Here, the first one, this is the first row, uh, time since passage of the PSLRA. So a variable that captures the possibility that they'll be learning over time. And there is a, a small, as I say here, one or two percentage point increase in compliance per year after passage. So in the first year, there is less compliance than in the second year. There's more in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on by a little bit, which suggests there is some learning. The uh, judicial negligence account is uh, some uh, possibility. But interestingly, judge-specific and court-specific exposure are not at all significant. That is, this judge has heard securities cases in the past. Is she more likely to make the findings after having had securities cases? And the answer is no. Another possibility is that particular courts have more securities cases and they will be more likely to make the findings. So, I'm at lunch with other judges, and they're talking about the cases they have, and they say, we do a lot of securities. Did you know about this statute? You've got to make these findings. We can reject that as well. Not a significant determinant of compliance. That's this uh, uh, second uh, row here. This is the coefficient, and this is just whether or not it's a statistically significant determinant of the left-hand side outcome. That is, did you make the finding or not? What about judicial inertia? Well, here we find a quite interesting, uh, and I should just note, in this table, uh, if it's a positive number, that means the outcome that is we're interested in, compliance with the statute, is more likely, and negative means less likely. So back here uh, on this one, time since the PSLRA, that uh, 0.018 is basically 1.8% percentage points in more likely uh, in every year since the PSLRA. Okay, so senior status is a quite negative. Judges who are senior are much less likely to make the findings than judges who are not senior status. This seems a little bit like maybe an old dog's new tricks problem. Senior judges are old guys. They've been around for a long time. They might not know about the new information, or if they know about it, they say, you know what, that's not the way I've done it. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah, my wife is a cancer doctor, and she sees this all the time. The, judge, the, the doctors who are 70 years old, they go, ah, I understand you're all that genetics and the new stuff and gene probe, whatever. That's not the way I do it, right? I, I use. Uh, uh, lots of Robitussin. That's my, you know, they, they got their ways. <laughs> the next column, uh, the next row, I'm sorry, helps us, I think, appreciate it's not so much old dogs, new tricks as it is maybe laziness. And the reason is the next line is does being the chief judge of the district court, is that consistent with? or predict compliance with the rule, and the answer is it really doesn't have any effect. So combining those two rows, what we see is senior judges are statistically much less likely to make the required findings, but chief judges are not. And those two judges, the most junior senior judge on the district court and the chief judge of the district court are very close in age because the chief judge is the oldest judge, the longest serving judge on that court, other than the person who is the most junior senior judge. The chief judge of that court's next move is senior status. Therefore, this looks like it's a proxy for something other than just 
time on the bench or age of the judge. Senior judges just don't care anymore. <laughs> Does politics matter? Uh, I mentioned the work of Epps, uh, Sunstein and Miles suggesting politics is an important determinant at the Court of Appeals. Work by Lee Epstein and others uh, uh, suggests that ideology matters a lot less at the district court level. And this is consistent with that. Ideology doesn't really determine compliance. I was pretty surprised, notwithstanding my knowledge of the Epstein study, I would have thought in an area like this, <laughs> which is kind of analogous to the employment discrimination cases in the Sunstein and Miles work on panel effects, I would have thought this would have been a factor. That is, Republican judges are much more likely to vote in favor of Rule 11 sanctions generally, and because the bill was passed uh, heavily by Republicans that they would be much more likely to, to use this as a tactic. I know when I clerked, uh, my judge and I uh, were very aligned in our thinking, and the one case we really disagreed with was on Rule 11 sanctions. I was in favor of really smacking down the lawyers, uh, and my judge and the other judges were not. Um, so uh, I was uh, surprised a little bit at this uh, outcome. What about appellate oversight and the idea that appeals courts are error reducing or error reversing uh, mechanisms? Well. Uh, there are two choices that we observed that appellate courts can make in these cases. So the uh, court does not, the district court does not make the required findings. The case goes up on appeal for this reason or other reasons. And the Court of Appeals has two choices. It can reverse and remand the case back to the district court on this issue and say, make the required Rule 11 findings. Or the Court of Appeals can say, uh, I'm going to reverse in effect, but I'm going to make the rule, required Rule 11 findings for myself. There's no reason to send it back to you, because I can tell from this case that Rule 11 was complied with, so I'm just going to save you the time and effort and not remand it back to you. Well, what we find is that in circuit courts where there is a precedent that says we reverse, and do not remand. We make the determination ourselves at the Court of Appeals, and then we look after that ruling, are those district courts in that circuit more likely or less likely to make the required findings? We find they are massively less likely. That is this minus about 10% number. The remand, that is the court reverses and remands back to the district court, doesn't really affect their compliance in a statistically significant way. So after a Court of Appeals decision that says, I'm going to reverse and I'm going to uh, decide for myself, that's associated with much less compliance. In other words, once the Court of Appeals signals that it will do the work for the district courts, the district courts say, OK, you want to do it? I'm not going to make these findings. In other words, District court judges don't care about reversal. What they care about is more work. Reverse me all you want, just don't give me anything to do. And if you tell me I got more work to do, then I'm going to do it the first time, maybe, because it's cheaper for me to do it the first time. I can just include this boilerplate language um, uh, instead of having to reopen the docket and bring everybody back in, et cetera. Uh, litigant behavior is another uh, potential uh, uh, driver of compliance. And we do find that uh, in our uh, sort of proxy for big, long, complicated cases, that's the number of docket entries. Every time you file a motion or something like that, there's a docket entry. That is associated with more uh, compliance. But there's no correlation between bad behavior and compliance with the statute. Most, as I said at the beginning, most of these, 125 out of 40, are boilerplates included in a settlement. And almost none of the dismissals of the complaints with prejudice at the motion to dismiss level, that is the worst cases. The ones that don't even get past the motion to dismiss and don't even get to discovery, almost none of them had the required uh, Rule 11 uh, findings. Why would the 
uh, parties not really have incentives to bring these even when they win? Well, the parties are repeat players the, with each other and with the court. And uh, it may be that there is a, a kind of reputational cost to bringing these. There's a first, there's a real cost of doing it when the stakes may be relatively low. And there's a, uh, uh, if I get you this time, you're going to play dirtier with me the next time. So the lawyers here may be internalizing things that are not exactly in the interest of their clients. The client might really want to punish the other side, but the lawyers who are the client's agent may say, hey, I'm going to see these guys again representing different clients, and I know they're going to make my life uh, difficult. So the lawyer is kind of representing both their current clients and their future clients, where the current clients don't want sanctions activity, the future clients might not want it because it's going to come back to get uh, them. Obviously, the statute is, in a sense, a recognition of this problem, the agency cost problem or the lack of incentives for courts and lawyers to do this. My beef with my judge and our decision in the Second Circuit when I was clerking there was I thought the court was reluctant to punish these lawyers because of a kind of uh, uh, you know, honor among thieves problem. <laughs> lawyers don't like lawyers. Ju judges are usually lawyers. And they don't like punishing other lawyers. It's a kind of there but for the grace of God go I thing. I know these guys. I've worked with these guys. Uh, and I'm not going to punish them. And in this case, I'll just say uh, quickly, it was uh, sanctionable behavior. The plaintiff sued Merrill Lynch on the grounds that he was fired from the mailroom because he had... Uh, AIDS. It's a pretty uh, a strong claim, if true. Uh, and when testifying in the trial in federal district court, uh, the defense lawyer asked him for proof that he had AIDS, and he said, the testing is anonymous. And when the lawyer said, well, I understand that they don't know who you are, but who are they? He said, no, no, it's anonymous. <laughs> well, obviously, you would have some evidence, and there was none. And the uh, district court judge uh, issued Rule 11 sanctions against this lawyer for reading this case, and it was uh, reversed uh, on appeal. OK. Um, our ex explanation is, um, uh, I think, uh, consistent with this. And that is, uh, the statute does nothing, really. Where the cost-benefit analysis for bringing sanctions is positive, where the parties uh, or have an incentive to bring this. The, the case is clearly frivolous. Uh, in the absence of a statutory command, the parties will bring the action. If the cost-benefit analysis, if the kind of net present value of bringing the sanctions activity is negative, then the parties are not going to raise this issue, even if the court is statutorily commanded to do it. Moreover, if the parties have settled the case, the last thing the court wants to do is kind of open hostilities after peace has been declared. The parties come to the judge and they say, OK, we've worked out all our differences. Here's the settlement. And the judge says, oh, by the way, let's now talk about how well behaved or badly behaved the lawyers were in the process of this. That seems like a bad thing to do when the parties have agreed uh, to settle. So what matters to compliance with the statute is not what these lawyers think, but people outside of the litigation. So for instance, uh, or another way of saying this is, why might the lawyers in this particular case include the language in a settlement agreement? They've agreed, we're not going to seek sanctions. Why would they put this language in there? Well, one possibility is it can raise an appealable issue. And there might be people who are outside of the class action, that is, shareholders who have opted out of the class or who object to the proposed settlement. And in the appeals court, they can point to this fact that the court didn't make the required findings as a way of kind of reopening uh, the case. I should note uh, something, uh, a fascinating uh, a fact we learned in the process of this. There was one district court, the Northern District of California, which sees a lot of these securities class action cases because of Silicon Valley. And high tech companies were a particular target of plaintiff's lawyers. They have very volatile stock prices. In that district court, the chief judge of the district court recognized the compliance problem 
And what she did is she required the clerk of the court not to enter any final judgment until the findings were made. I think her thinking was something like this. If I go to these judges and tell them to do this, they'll just disregard me. And I don't want to go and do this and tell them to do this because it's kind of awkward. We're similarly situated and I'm telling them their business and how to run their life. So instead, I'm going to find someone who has to go because they're kind of just, it's just a ministerial function. And so the, the, it would play out something like this. The clerk of the court would walk in and knock on the judge's door and say, oh, Your Honor, I'm really sorry to have to do this. I'm just bound by this obligation, this rule that the stupid Congress gave us, that the district court has implemented. I am literally not able to enter judgment on this. The computer won't let me do it unless you enter these findings. So could you please include this boilerplate in your document? Even in the Northern District locality, this does not work. Compliance <laughs> is no higher in the Northern District of California than any other district court. OK, so the rule is an abysmal failure. In some ways, I'm surprised compliance is even 14% because it's not really doing anything. It's not working at all in the cases that the Republicans had in mind. It, never, uh, may, it nevertheless might be uh, a bargaining tool. It might be kind of deliciously powerful in a way and in a way that we cannot measure. OK, the idea goes something like this. The district court can threaten the lawyers. Now, of course, the district court could always threaten the lawyers. But this gives her the ability to threaten the lawyers in a particularly nice way. She can say, my hands are bound. I don't want to make Rule 11 findings. We're all friends here. I'm going to see you guys next week. But I don't have a choice. Newt Gingrich told me I have to. And you know I am going to have a hearing. Again, it's a hearing I don't want to have. We're friends. But we're going to have this hearing, and therefore, you guys should think twice before you uh, uh, file this complaint again. So I'm going to dismiss this complaint, because I think it's not up to snuff. And I'm going to allow you to refile it. But you should know, if you refile it, there is this obligation. I have to make Rule 11 findings. So just keep that in mind. Now again. The judge could have said this in the past, but the mandatory nature might make it a little bit more uh, threatening. So here was an example from the Southern District of New York. In reviewing a proposed settlement, the court said, if the plaintiff chooses to proceed, it should be mindful of the requirement of the Rule 11 sanctions finding at the end of the case. A threat that might be more credible because of the mandatory nature. Now the problem, of course, is the lawyers could probably see through this. You could have done it anyway. And by the way, Rule 11 findings are not higher now than they were in the past. And the number of Rule 11 findings is trivially small. And so therefore, it's not really that scary to us that you're going to sanction us. Of course, this might affect the selection effects. Knowing this, the kinds of cases that come to the court might be a little bit better, and the merits might be more important. That is, the number of frivolous actions may be lower now than in the past, but that would require us to have some measure of, uh, of the merits of securities class action cases, which we don't have. OK, that's what I have to say. I'd be happy to take uh, any of your questions. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, okay, so you said that when the cost-benefit analysis is positive, they do it. When it's negative, they don't. And so, does but does the data sort of suggest? Like, I, I feel like you were kind of getting at this, but does the data suggest that that whether or not there's a rule doesn't factor into the cost-benefit analysis? Because, like, <coughs> like I mean, you said about 14% of them are doing this now, and I presume that that wasn't happening before at all, right? So, so I'm wondering, like, is this totally a null issue, or is it like, well, it affects them, but just not very much? Yeah. So we, uh, good. So the question is, do we, uh, does the mandatory nature of the statute affect the cost-benefit analysis? I think the answer is no, uh, subject to what I said at the end, that it, there is this additional threat the district court can make. But um, for the lawyers, the question is, is it worth my time and effort 
both the time I'm going to put in now and the reputational cost going forward to roll the dice on getting this court to give me attorney's fees, which is the presumptive remedy in this case. That's just an equation of how much are we going to get, what the probability times uh, the magnitude of that uh, award is, and then the effects going forward. That has no effect on the mandatory nature because if it's in my interest to bring it, I'll just raise it on my own. And I'll say, Your Honor, I'm filing a motion for Rule 11 against the plaintiffs. Litigants have had that right to do that forever. Nothing about this changes this. All this says is, if the litigants don't raise it, you have to raise it. That's what the statute in effect says. right? And if it was valuable for the litigants to raise it, they would have raised it. And if it's not valuable for them to raise it, they're not going to raise it. And because the district court doesn't know, doesn't care, doesn't have the incentives to, or doesn't want to make matters worse, they're not going to do it if the parties don't want to do it. Why should I? If you guys don't want to talk about it, I don't want to talk about it. In that model, compliance should be zero. Now, it could be a kind of uh, maybe principled laziness. That is, I know I'm lazy and I don't want to do it, but I'm going to kind of do it every once in a while or something. Uh, there could be some other theories, but I don't know. Yes, please. So you kind of slipped this in at the end, but why don't we think that this is what we're seeing here is really just a product of an increase in the quality of the cases? Because the, I guess the story that you kind of laid out, right, would be, well, we don't really care that they're doing whether they're doing this analysis. What we care is whether there's an increased willingness to apply the sanctions. Yeah. And thus, if lawyers expect them to have this increased, you know, application of the sanction, the sanctions, they're going to, they're only going to, you know, do the better cases. So, are we sure that that's not happening? No, we're not sure. There is a large literature about whether or not the PSLRA made securities class action quality. So we just take the run of class actions this year, the number of securities class actions, is the quality of those cases higher or lower post PSLRA? There's a large literature on that. Now, one of the problems with getting at that question in this context is the PSLRA had a lot of moving pieces. So disaggregating the effect this has from something else is quite hard. The, as I mentioned, you have to plead fraud with more particularity. Who the lead plaintiff is presumptively has changed. The discovery stay, all of those things. And I'd say the, if I had to summarize that literature, I'd say people think the overall quality of securities at class actions has increased. Moreover, the uh, US attorneys have put several plaintiff's lawyers in jail uh, for having safes full of money and clients on retainer that would just be able to go and access these kind of bribes for acting as stalking horse plaintiffs. So there's been a lot of things pushing back. Uh, another factor is Supreme Court jurisprudence. The Supreme Court in a series of cases, uh, Stone Ridge, Tell Labs, Dura Pharmaceuticals, etc. Some of see my some of my security students here. You know these cases. The Supreme Court has consistently pushed back against plaintiff's lawyers in completely absurd ways that have, you know, if you just look at the case, you'd say, really? And what's motivating them is we hate plaintiff's lawyers in the securities class action world and we don't want them to win. So we're going to completely tie ourselves in knots so they don't win. So that's also going. So we can't really disaggregate that. Our theory for why this might be a tool is the one I mentioned, this kind of thread. It needs to be credible. Uh, it's going to be very subtle, because it could happen in conference in chambers or in a way that we can't pick up with any uh, data necessarily. Uh, and if I was Congress and I was thinking about these kind of mandatory statutes in the future, the most important takeaway is you cannot, through a mandate, do something that is not consistent with litigant behavior in the background of judicial uh, theories of judicial behavior, which are not as idealistically pure as the kind of naive model. Judges are lazy. They've got lots of work to do. The federal number of federal statutes and rules very complex. And so they are largely going to be putty in the hands of the lawyers. I'm just kind of curious, what other rules or laws did you maybe think of that you might, want, might have wanted to use as the basis for your study at the outset? Are there any other rules that you thought could never be violated that you were interested in looking at? 
Oh, uh, that's a good question. We didn't, I mean, this was, uh, this was how um, uh, cross uh, legal disciplinary work happens. We were uh, at, you know, sitting down for lunch together and I said, uh, oh, hey, there's this really interesting thing, the mandate, and I read this thing in the newspaper, and da 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 and oh, that's interesting, and he's empirically minded, and I knew about this particular statute because I teach this stuff, and that's how it happened. Uh, do I know of other mandates in law? Sure. There are, you know, I don't know them off the top of my head, but there are other ones, and you could look at those. I'm not sure this study was worth doing, so I'm not sure that a, <laughs> a series of spawned children would be worth the investment. Uh, but perhaps if there were examples, and if people have them, I'd love to hear them, maybe there are ones that are particularly interesting that could provide a nice counterweight, or maybe there's something different about the context of, you know, key TAM litigation or employment cases or, you know, something else uh, that go to judicial behavior where we'd see different dynamics. You know, one thing that I really wanted to test, which we got no traction on at all, was do the law firms matter? So I was really interested in, we just didn't have the data size because we got no results on this, but imagine it's, there's a, you know, five or 10 plaintiff's firms who do the bulk of this work. And then there's a bunch of defense firms that do the bulk of this work. And one theory is big plaintiff firm faces off against big defense firm, there's no way they're gonna seek rule 11 sanctions against each other because they know I'm going to see you in 20 more cases. And, you know, we have to have settlement discussions. And we've got to go out for beers together. And the last thing I want to do is be trying to get attorney's fees from you. I'm just going to piss you off, and then you're going to be pissed off at me, and it's just going to be, you know, Hatfields and McCoys. So that's one theory. The other theory is the big defense firms see these plaintiff's firms all the time, and they hate those guys. And they just say, we're going to extract a pound of flesh out of you so you behave the next time because it's in the interest of my clients going forward. We wanted to tell, like, I don't know, it could be either of those. A for sure, I have no reason to believe one or the other. We could have tested, no results. Another version thing we could test is maybe the, the one-off plaintiff's lawyer firm who brings a case is more likely to be sanctioned because the defense lawyers know, well, we're never gonna see these guys again. They can't extract any payment from us in the future or cost on us, impose costs on us, so we'll go after them. And again, we just didn't find any uh, results. So there's lots of things I'd love to test our compliance rate and our data was just too, too low to give us any results. Since I'm a small time litigator, I agree with everything you said. As a practical matter, every uh, bad attorney gets one free bite. So if you're going to bring sanction, uh, Rule 11 sanctions, you better be warning the judge beforehand. This guy's, you know, the chambers are saying, this guy's really screwing around, this guy's doing this, tell him to stop a judge. The guy keeps doing it, then you, you may get sanctions, or if the judge doesn't heed you, you may bring your Rule 11 sanctions or the same thing in state court. But basically, I agree with you, the attorneys and the judge really controls the litigation. The, uh, the legal realm is a semi-autonomous realm. It got along, we did judging long be before we had legislators telling judges what to do. The attorneys and the judges control the case. There's a certain amount of parsimony. Judges have only so much time, and the attorneys only have so many times they can raise their voice to the judge, say, judge, this is important to me, look at this again, or this guy's screwing off you have only so many times to raise your voice. So sanctions or whatever get raised when they're important to the attorneys, and if they're not, people don't worry about things that aren't important. Yeah. And, uh, so, so really, the attorneys and the judge, it's a three, or menage a trois, they control the litigation. It's a semi-autonomous realm. And if it doesn't matter to these three people, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so, uh, right. So uh, uh, I'm, I've proved, I've done a lot of work to prove the obvious, that if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think that's a good, that's a good summary. Um, <laughs> Interestingly, though, in, this, in these cases, a lot of the cases that are dismissed are the third or fourth amended complaint, which is dismissed at the motion to dismiss phase. So this idea that lawyers get kind of one free bite, well, here, like, they're getting three or four bites. And I'm a little bit surprised. I have to say that I would have thought if I was a district court judge uh, and being someone who is uh, uh, quite hostile to securities class actions, I don't even think we should have them. Uh, and if I were on the bench, 
I would have thought I would have used this much more aggressively. Uh, and the fact that there basically are not, well, maybe it's a selection effect. Maybe that's why I'm not a district court judge. But <laughs> I, I, I think I would have, whatever my baseline would have been before this patch of the, the passage of the statute, I would have thought I would have seen an increase in my usage. Because I could say, I'm less inhibited now because I can say, look, Congress is making me do this, guys. So it, it lowers the cost for people who are inclined anyway to make Rule 11 um, hearings. If the, if the attorney's screwing around, the judge is going to get angry that he's wasting the judge's time and the other attorney's time. And the judge is going to you know, call the, attorney, the abusing attorney into chambers and say, stop screwing around with this, or I will do it. You don't put stuff on the record the first or the second time. It only gets on the record when things aren't yes. going well. And I'm just assuming that in a fourth amended complaint that's dismissed on the motion to dismiss, that stuff hadn't worked. Yeah. And there was a lot of those. And yet in those cases, we didn't see uh, judges having hearings to scold plaintiff's lawyers. Uh, and the punchline there is, that uh, judges are reactive and not proactive. You don't do it in a hearing, you do it in chambers. I mean, you first do it without putting stuff yeah. on paper. Good. Other questions? I think we have time for one more question. Please. Uh, do outcomes change if the judges are elected as opposed to appointed? Uh, uh, it's a good question. Uh, obviously, our data set is federal district court judges who are all appointed. Um, so, uh, piggybacking off this question, if there was examples from state law, now we've really entered into the rabbit's hole. So, uh, you know, 50 different states, do they have commands, mandatory commands, and do we see a difference? Uh, and I guess the idea, your hypothesis would be that the elected judges would be more responsive to legislative pressure. Perhaps? Yes? No? Well, maybe. I don't know, though, because what you pointed out in your study doesn't I mean you, you didn't seem to suggest that they really cared about what... Uh, well, what they don't care about right? Congress. My guess is the district so. court uh, doesn't care at all what Congress tells them to do. Right. But that may be because Congress really doesn't have much control over them. So maybe if the people who were kind of writing statutes through the representatives have some control over both judges and the people writing the statute, maybe they might care more. I don't know if in this case that would be true. It is kind of interesting, though. There are other choices. So there's the Administrative Office of US Courts. And they are kind of the bureaucrats in charge of making sure district court judges comply with law. They print out all the forms that district court judges use for things like orders. Uh, they collect a bunch of data about judicial behavior. They also don't care. So, you know, they could say, look, there's, to your point, 27 mandatory things you've got to do. Uh, it depends on what case you're in. Here's your little guidebook. You know, you've got tabs. Ah, at the end of the case, I got to do this. Like, I'm surprised in some sense that there isn't something like that. But then again, in a system without tenure or with tenure, and I live in one, and there's nobody controlling me. Right? I don't have a book with tabs like it's Wednesday, you gotta be doing this. Like I show up to teach my class, and that's it. I can go, you know, watch movies and play video games the rest of the time. Uh, and I'm surprised there's not a, a bureaucracy built in place to countervail that, recognizing the decreased incentives people have from things like lifetime tenure. <laughs> and with that, I thank you all for coming.